Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to Equipping Hour. We are in installment number two of looking at the life of Joseph and God's providence in the life of Joseph. Last week, we looked at chapters 37 through 41 of Genesis, and we saw Joseph go down to Egypt, how God got him there, how God sent him there, the difficulties that he endured for 13 years before he stood before Pharaoh and was made the ruler of Egypt as his prime minister over all of the land. Everything was at his disposal. So this week, we're going to look at how God sends the rest of his people, the rest of Jacob's family, down to Egypt, just as he had promised he would do. And so in chapters 42 through 47, what we'll look at today, I have the outline there on the screen of uh, the entire series. Today, we're going to focus on God's plan to make a nation. God's plan to make a nation. And in chapter 42 through 44, we see the account of Joseph's brothers coming down to Egypt to meet him. Chapter 45 is Joseph's self-disclosure and his instruction to his brothers. And chapter 46 and 47, we see J Jacob's entire household come down from Canaan to Egypt, and God puts in motion an incubation period that would, 430 years later, be the nation of Israel. And so go ahead and open your Bibles. Look at chapter 42. Open your Bibles to Genesis 42. And I want you to just remember, as we go through this series, that the purpose of the series, the purposes that we have here in for equipping our is to think rightly about God's providence. And sometimes just thinking rightly about God's providence in the moment is just to simply define it. And that is that God's providence is his sovereignty and his purposes. So God's sovereignty that cannot be violated and his purposes, which always come to pass. That is how we define God's providence. So that's purpose number one. And then purpose number two to equipping our is to just get familiar again with the details of the Joseph narrative, to put it to put the story in its proper historical context and its place in God's redemptive plan so we can observe all that the Old Testament saints look forward to and gain some perspective from that. So let's begin by looking at the timeline. You guys have uh, resources that you can uh, download from the website. And here's the first one, the timeline. Today, we're going to look at the section highlighted there in the red box. It's the center of the timeline, and here's a zoomed-in piece of it. I'm not sure how well you can see that on the screen, but it's uh, there for you on the website. So hopefully you're looking at that. those. The text says that, well, first, let's go through a few notes on the timeline. Uh, what we're going to look at today, it, it's quite remarkable. There's a lot that happens in these five chapters. Um, the first thing that we'll note is that where we left off is where the seven years of abundance began, right? Joseph was uh, put over all of Egypt by Pharaoh, and immediately the seven years of abundance began uh, when Joseph stood before Pharaoh. Six years into that, Joseph had his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And then uh, the next year, the famine began. And the same year that the famine began, um, or I'm sorry, two years into the famine, it kind of everything happens. And, and so today, we're going to look at that year. So last week, we looked at events over uh, chapters 37 through 41 that took place in a 13-year period. Today, we're going to look at chapters 42 through 47, and those events take place in a two-year period, and really a one-year period. There's only one event that we'll look at today that happened in the following year. So a lot happened in this year. You can see that uh, at the top of the timeline, Sesostris III becomes the pharaoh during the famine year. And so uh, we just kind of have to be reminded that the pharaohs that Joseph served under were more than one. There was a, an abundance pharaoh, and then his son, the, the uh, a pharaoh that was ruling over Egypt during the time of the famine. It's possible that his father died suddenly, and so it makes sense that when Jacob finally does come down to, to, uh, to Egypt, and Joseph says to him, God has made me a father to Pharaoh, it can give you some context that this pharaoh was quite, young, quite, uh, quite a bit younger than Joseph. 
And another thing that happened is Joseph was reunited with his entire family. Um, and really everything we're going to look at today happens in, in, in a one-year period. And then later you see that last event, Joseph buys all the livestock, all the land, and all the people for Pharaoh the following year. And then you have this big gap, which is a 17-year gap till uh, the next events that are recorded in chapters 48 happen. Jacob uh, dying and then Joseph dying. So we'll look at that next week. So the text says that Jacob and his brothers came from Hebron and the Beersheba area down to see Joseph. And so I wanted to give you a depiction of what that route looked like. And so you've got a, a map. And if you can see the red line, you can see the land of Canaan there on the right. And then down the Nile Delta fan basin where Joseph was stationed, uh, at the top right of your screen there in Canaan, you've got Beersheba, the Hebron area, and then a 290-mile route to where Joseph would have been stationed in the Fayum Basin, where the large agricultural projects were, where he oversaw the construction of Sesostris II's um, pyramid and administrative government from there. To give you an idea, that the journey from Canaan down to Egypt, where Joseph was, was a 290-mile route, and what you see there is uh, an elevation change of only about 800 feet. So this is a long, flat, dusty route to Egypt. And a donkey caravan, which is what they would have been traveling with, would have taken maybe the brothers about eight days. Uh, that would be fast, but that would be them without any supplies. And then the larger caravans uh, that happen in the story when Jacob is brought down to Egypt and then later when he dies in an entire Egyptian caravan is sent back up to Canaan. Those caravans probably took 12, 14 days. So that'll give you an idea of uh, what the back and forth looked like for them. And then the green arrow there right at the uh, opening of the Nile Delta is an important milestone, or I'm sorry, uh, waypoint in the journey. Twice in the journey in the story that we're going to look at uh, the brothers are stopped, right? The, the first time they stop at a lodging place and find their money in their sacks, and that, was at their, that would have been their first night. And so I've, depict, I've given you an arrow there to show you about how far they would have made it. And then later in the story, once J, uh, Joseph sabotages their plans and puts his silver cup in their satchels, he sends, their, he sends his people after them just a few hours out. And so that would have been even closer to that uh, Fayum Basin there where Joseph was. And so just to give you an idea of where these events take place on their journey, Joseph was stationed in uh, the ancient city called Lahun. And this is where the headquarters of the grain storage operation would have been. I have a photo of the complex there. This is the pyramid that would have been built under Joseph's supervision for Pharaoh this is the Sostris, the second uh, uh, pyramid. And then there would have been an administrative complex around that. We've seen some of those ruins. And so all of this took place on Joseph's watch. Got another photo of that area. So these ancient sites, are we able to get to the next one? Okay, here's, an, here's another vantage point of that same pyramid. And you can see in the, in the uh, foreground uh, other structures. Those would have been tombs of Pharaoh's officials. So inside those tombs, you'd find hieroglyphics, things written on the walls. And so we can see some of the history. That's where we gain some of our knowledge of uh, the ancient Near East for all these epigraphical uh, depictions of what happened during that period. And in one of those tombs, I'll give you an example of what would have been on the walls. Uh, the top is a photograph. The second is just a, uh, a painting so you can see it a little bit better. But what you have here from the time period of Sesostris II and Sesostris III is uh, uh, a depiction of foreigners coming down to give gifts to Pharaoh. And so you can even notice the different dress that the foreigners have from the Egyptians there on your right. And so the, the, this is just a depiction of them bringing gifts down to Pharaoh. The, the, uh, 
A depiction doesn't tell us whether or not they're bringing gifts down to Pharaoh to buy grain or to buy food or simply because uh, they were uh, on the losing end of some of the Sosthenes III's uh, military campaigns that existed in Canaan. But this is what it would have been like, and it's a good place to just start looking at the text because Jacob saw that there was food in Egypt. Jacob saw that there was food in Egypt. And so what we'll do in chapter, beginning with chapter 42 is we'll review the story. And again, like we did last week, we'll skip like a rock over water over a lot of material just to get an idea of the flow of the story. And then we'll go back and look at some of the patterns that Moses records. So let's begin in chapter 42, verses one through five. Now, Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt and Jacob said to his sons, why are you staring at one another? He said, behold, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some grain for us so that we may live and not die. Then the 10 brothers of Joseph went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, I am afraid that harm may befall him. So the sons of Israel came to buy grain among those who were coming for the famine was in the land of Canaan also. Uh, the famine would have taken place over all of the Fertile Crescent, and it was severe in the land. We see that three times in the, past, in the uh, narrative. And so everyone was going down there. This, it was not just Jacob's family. There was caravan after caravan. And this is why Jacob has heard there's grain down in Egypt. People keep going down empty-handed and coming back with grain. Go down there. So that's what they do. One detail I want you to notice from what we just read is that J Jacob, Joseph, and Judah, through the course of the story, continue to ground their reasoning in the preservation of this particular family line. Not, 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 not just that they might go hungry, and not just that they might be hungry, but go down to get grain so we don't die. Now, of course, one risk is that they go hungry or that they could be hungry, but what Moses records over and over, and he wants us to see this, is that there's a preservation of God's promises that are currently with this family line. And that preservation just continues all the way through the Old Testament. And you see that highlighted in stories with Josiah, with Mordecai, all the way down to Herod the Great, when God is preserving that line all the way to the Messiah. And so this is one of those times he is preserving his promises. When they arrive in Egypt... As you read, Joseph recognizes them, but he disguises himself and he speaks harshly to them, accuses them of being spies, and he locks them up, locks them all up for three days. And then three days later, he reverses his intentions and has Simeon bound before his eyes, before their eyes, and he sends the rest of them back to Canaan. Go ahead and look at verses 18 uh, through 20. Now, Joseph said to them, on the third day, do this and live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined to, to, uh, in, in your prison, but as for the rest of you, go, carry grain for the famine of your households and bring your youngest brother to me so that your words may be verified and so you will not die. And they did so. Skip down to verse 26. So they loaded their donkeys with their grain and departed from there. As one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money. And behold, it was in the mouth of his sack. And he said to his brothers, my money has been returned. And behold, it is even in my sack. And their hearts sank. And they turned trembling to one another saying, what is this God has done? When they came to their father, Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them. We went down to Egypt, just like he said. The man was harsh. This, he put us in jail for three days. We spent all weekend locked up. And, and then we got halfway home, not even halfway home, only a day away. And all of our money was returned to our sack. So what uh, unfolds is a very bewildering back and forth for these brothers. And so eventually they go through all of their food 
And, and telling the story to Jacob, I want you to note in verse 35, it says, now it came about as they were emptying, emptying their sacks, as they were emptying their sacks, and behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and, when they and their father saw that their bundles of money, this is in Canaan before their eyes, they were dismayed. So all of them had their money, not even just one, but all of them. This is confusing. And so they stayed in the land of Canaan for probably four to six weeks. And we know that because when Judah eventually says, look, Jacob, we, we could have been there twice by now. We could have returned twice by now. That would have fit about a, a four to six week period. And so that's what he says. Judah reminds Jacob that the man says, don't come back without Benjamin. He says, don't come back without Benjamin. And so Jacob replies in chapter 43, verse 6, saying, why did you treat me so badly by telling the man whether you still had another brother? But they said to him, the man questioned particularly about us and our relatives saying, is your father still alive? Have you another brother? So we answered his questions. Could we possibly know that he would say, bring your brother down? Judah said to his father, send the lad, the 38-year-old lad, Benjamin, with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die. We, as well as you, and our little ones. So Jacob says, all right, bring Benjamin, and bring gifts too. Bring almonds, bring bring balm, bring everything from the land, the very best of the land. And, and guys, this time, bring double the money and give it to them. So verse 15, the men took this present and took double the money in their hand and Benjamin as well. And they went and arose and they went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. And in their anxiety over all of this, they, they are afraid. They're afraid of what's going to happen. And when Joseph sees Benjamin, verse 16, he said to his house steward, bring the men into my house and slay an animal and make ready for the men are to dine with me at noon. And so the man did as Joseph said. And they brought the men to Joseph's house. And they were afraid. They were afraid of what would happen next. They were afraid that their sins were going to come back to haunt them. And so, I want to look at verse 23, and I want you to take notice of something. This is a, maybe an, an, an extra detail to the main part of the story, but I do want you to see it. In their fear... They come to the house steward, the guy at the gate, and he says, peace be to you. Be at ease. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. And really nothing else is said about that exchange, but I think it's fascinating. What does this Egyptian house steward know about the God of their father? This was, this was Joseph's house steward. That's why they knew about, that's why he knew about the God of their father. And this house steward, this servant was in on it all with Joseph, carrying out the details of the plan that he had had, which appears to have changed time and time again. This was a bewildering moment for Joseph as well. But just in that verse, you can see that Joseph's faith wasn't a secret one. Pharaoh knew about Yahweh. His administration knew about Yahweh. Joseph's closest circles knew about Yahweh. And they could confirm Joseph's reputation of depending on Yahweh. So much so that his servant at the gate says, don't be afraid. Your God and the God of your fathers have given you treasure. So Joseph comes home and they share a meal together. But the bewilderment continues in their journey. Look at verses 32 through 34. 
So they served him by himself, that's Joseph, and them by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with them by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat bread with Hebrews, for that was loathsome to them. Now, they were seated before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked around at each other in astonishment. This was a confusing journey for these men. But God was at work, and we'll see what God was doing in them. The next morning, all the brothers depart together, and Joseph sabotages their plan by putting his special cup, his silver cup, in their bags, sending them on his way. But just as they have departed, not far out, probably just hours, on the way to crossing the Nile, he sends his men after his brothers, and they are confused all the more. Their reaction is, look, enough is enough. And then look at verse 8 of chapter 44. This has got to be Reuben. He says, Behold, the money which we found in the mouths of our sacks we have brought back to you from the land of Canaan. How could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? With whomever your servant it is found, let him die. And we also will become the Lord's slaves. Or your Lord's slaves. And so they drop their sacks, and his men find the silver cup. They tear their clothes, and now they're at the mercy of Joseph once again. They begin their walk of shame back to Joseph's house, back to the city. And verses 14 through 15 record what happens when they get there. When, Joseph, when Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, Joseph was still there. And they fell to the ground before him. And Joseph said, what is this deed that you have done? Do you not know that a man such as I can indeed practice divination? Well, what is this divination all about? The, the, the word there, and it's uh, maybe a question mark in the story as you're reading through it. The idea of divination there was, is the words used once before, and um, it seems to be practicing an di informed discernment that came from seeking insight from God directly. Laban uses this verb to determine that Yahweh has blessed his own household on account of Jacob's being there. And later, after the time of the patriarchs, this practice was outlawed by God because God had written his word and given it to his people for discernment. Nevertheless, Joseph pierces their conscience with the fear of God, and Judah replies in verse 16 and says, what can we say? What can we say to my Lord? What can we speak? And how can we justify ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's slaves, both we and the one in whose possession the cup has been found. So now bewilderment has become total helplessness. And what follows helps us answer a couple questions. What was Joseph doing in all of this back and forth? What were his purposes why was he toying with his brothers, changing his mind on who stays, who goes, locking them up, changing the plan, sending one back, sabotaging their, their plans, bringing them back, making them at the mercy of, of, of his authority? And then more importantly, what is God doing in all of this? Both of those questions can be answered by observing some of the same details in the story. And the details remind us that God is always at work in disorienting circumstances. God is always at work in disorienting circumstances. Nothing is a roll of the dice. 
Nothing is reactive. He's not playing catch up on what to do with your mess. He's not playing catch up on what to do with these brothers as they're going down to Egypt. For God's people, his intentions are always good and his purposes always come to pass. Next week, we'll look at how the bad fits into the good and how that equation plays itself out. And God here is doing many things. He's doing several things in the story. Two of those things that he's doing in the story, he also does in your life, in my life, when we're in a time of crisis, when we're in an uh, elongated time of, in, of suffering or hostility. Number one, he's doing a sanctifying work. He's doing a sanctifying work. He's exposing sin. He's bringing that to the surface, bringing things to the surface that are patterns in our life that are not going to heaven with us. And he's dealing with those things. So, so that we can see sin for what it is and put it to death. He's also refocusing your hope. When, when you are in a crisis circumstance, a bewildering moment and disorienting circumstances, he is always directing you to that which is stable, the ballast in your life, God's promises. And so he is refocusing your hope, fixing your attention on his intentions and promises. So those two purposes bear themselves out in the back and forth in this narrative that we just read. And so let's look at some of those details. Flip back to chapter 42 and verse 11. When the brothers first arrive in Egypt, they present themselves as honest men. Honest men, and, and the idea here is that they're morally upright, just, men who take the high ground. This might be how you present yourself to someone who has your life in their hands, who has the answers to the questions you think you need to have answered. And so these men present themselves as just. But they're presenting themselves to Joseph. And they're maintaining that before God. Verse 42, 11 says, in response to Joseph's accusations that they are spies, we are all sons of one man. We are honest men. And then Joseph puts them to the test saying in verse 19, if you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined and you guys go back. And then again, when they bring their account back to Jacob weeks later, they re recount over and over again. Verse 31, we told the man, we said, we are honest men. We're not spies. That's how we've represented ourselves. And he said to us, by this I'll know if you're honest men. And again, in verse 34, prove that you're not spies, but honest men. And so now you have what's framed up for us by Moses is a depiction of the men as they see themselves, which is just upright with a moral compass that works, honest men. This is a misrepresentation to their father. It's a misrepresentation to Joseph, the only authority that could help him. So Joseph says, all right, prove it. Prove that you're honest men. So he puts a test in motion. But why? Look at 42.16. Why is he putting them to the test? So that your words might be tested. Then again in verse 20, so that your words might be verified. 22 years ago, you were lying murderers. Can you be trusted? I put all that behind me, Joseph says. In fact, I named my son Manasseh because God has caused me to forget all my troubles and all my father's household. If this is not a struggle for me, I can evaluate you and say, I don't think you're honest men. You must be tested. And so that's what he does. So the problem is that they've, represented themselves as honest, but externally, 
But internally, they are conflicted right off the bat. As soon as it comes out of their mouth that they're honest men, go ahead and look at 4221. They turn internally, so to speak, to one another, and they say, truly, we are guilty. So, so they're conflicted. Their conscience has been burdened for 22 years with murder and lying and manipulation and, and Joseph knew this. Jo- Joseph knew that they had another brother as well. And so the nature of his test wasn't to verify whether or not he had a brother, but the test was a real test. This was a genuine test that Joseph wanted to put before his brothers to say, have you changed at all? Are you any different than you used to be? Because the brothers that I know are murderers. Can you be tested? I'm sorry, can you be trusted? That was the issue here. So what's he do? Joseph fills their sacks with money without their knowledge. And when they find it on their first night, probably about 12 hours out at the lodging place, they tremble. See, honest men would have said, guys, we have the grain and the money. We're supposed to just have the grain. And we have a whole nother week to go. Someone load up the money and send it back because after all, we're honest men. But they don't do that. They keep going. And and, and after all, it's Jacob that instructs him to bring double the money the next time. And so this is the nature of the testing that's happening for the brothers. Can they be trusted? Are they honest? Are they upright men? Nevertheless, 22 years has given them clarity. Judah, if you notice in verse 28, says, look, we know we're guilty, and they call it sin. I'm sorry, back up at verse 22. They call it sin. And then down at the end of verse 28, they ask the right question. It's not the ruler of Egypt that's doing this to us. It's God, and I'm not sure what he's doing right now. And so his question is, what is this that God is doing to us? And so this begins to come to the surface. God begins to deal with their guilt. So when this whole ordeal comes to a head in chapter 44, 16, go ahead and turn back there. And they no longer have any control over their circumstance. They come to grips with their guilt. And Joseph says, now you can go, just leave Benjamin. And, and he's not privy to the details of the plan that, or to, to the, to, to the um, hesitation that Jacob has, although he might suspect it. But he says, okay, go ahead and bring, you guys can go back. Far be it for me to keep all of you as slaves. I'll just keep Benjamin, my brother. And so when the ordeal comes to the head, God's dealing with their guilt, and he's trying to figure out, Joseph is, if, 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 I, can, if I can trust anyone. It doesn't seem like I can trust the brothers. And, and if you play this pattern out, and you see his back and forth, changing his mind, keeping one, sending the rest, keeping them all, sabotaging their plans, it seems like he's trying to get to his father. It appears that he's trying to get to his father whom he can trust. Maybe he can trust uh, Benjamin. Maybe he discloses to Benjamin who he really is. Uh, nevertheless, his plans are shattered, and they're shattered emotionally with Judah's plea. Judah pleads with Joseph, the ruler, and what he says breaks him. Judah recounts the whole ordeal in humility in the following verses. And after all, this has been a testing time for Joseph as well. Three times throughout the story, right, he's had to go find a place to weep. He wasn't looking for this occasion. Perhaps during the famine, he thought, maybe I'll see my brothers. But the entire world was coming to him. And when they do show up, it's it's an emotional reunion. And And it continues to be emotional. He had to find a place to weep three different times. So as God in his providence is dealing with the guilt of his brothers, he is also redirecting their hope and Joseph's hope. 
as, as, as the world is becoming more difficult for Joseph in this moment, in his circumstances, how do I navigate these things? What comes out of him has to do with the hope that he has, that has been in him since he was sold into slavery 22 years earlier. And that's just the nature of how hard circumstances work. Difficult circumstances squeeze you, and whatever has been your hope, whatever resonates with you, whatever you've been looking forward to, is what comes out. And, and, and that can go several different ways. If your mind has been uh, stuck on difficulties with a self-focus, then anxiety and fear will come out. However, in Joseph's case, what we see is, is an example of what should come out of a believer, someone who trusts in God's promises, looking forward to the future fulfillment of those promises because nothing this side of heaven is guaranteed. Joseph believed that. You believe that as a Christian. And so look what comes out of him. It's what's been in him the whole time. If it was vengeance and bitterness that was in him for 22 years, you can bet that's exactly what would have come out. He had the authority to do whatever he pleased. He had the resources that no one else had. And so he was absolutely in control of the situation. And so if he had anger that was stored up for 22 years, you can bet that these men would have been put to death. They would have been confined to jail forever or whatever Joseph wanted. But notice what comes out. Over and over again, he's asking his brothers without disclosing his identity because he cannot trust these men. Is your father still alive? Is he well? He's asking them detailed questions about their family. Is your old father, the one that you, that you spoke of, is he still alive? And perhaps he was going to get more disclosure from Benjamin about his father, concerning his father. We're not sure exactly because Judah has uh, several verses of dialogue in humility. But Joseph had banked his life on God's promises. And at this point in redemptive history, those promises had made it as far as Jacob. He didn't know to look for the tribe of Judah next. He didn't know to look for King David and all that the prophets would, prophets would later say. At this point on God's timeline, his promises were with Jacob and Jacob had not yet disclosed where those blessings would go next. And so Joseph needs to answer the question for his, for his own good. The only interest that he has in this moment is, okay, this is a hard circumstance. I'm not sure how to navigate the details of today, but I'm refocused on what God has said he will do. All of the promises that he gave to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. That's where I've got to focus. And so what comes out of him is the natural question that would, if those are where the questions were. What, is, is he still alive? Has he disclosed where the promises go from here? Has he given his blessing yet? He couldn't ask those questions of the men he couldn't trust that might disclose who he was. And so he simply asked the question, is your father still alive? So when Judah says, I, I, look, I can't, I can't go back. I can't go back without Benjamin. It says this, 44, 31, look at verse 31. When he, that's Jacob, sees that the lad is not with us, he will die. Thus your servant will bring the gray hair of your servant, your, our father, down to Sheol in sorrow. For your servant, that's Judah, became a surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then let me bear the blame before my father forever. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord. And so here, Judah says, look, just keep me. And, and, and that, that is utter humility. His plans were to go back. He had a promise that he made to his father. And he's following through in humility as an honest man. Saying, keep me, make me your slave and send Benjamin back. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me? For fear that I would see the evil that would overtake my father. And overwhelmed with emotion, 
whatever plans Joseph had for his brothers came to a halt and he breaks. 45, then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him and cried, have everyone go out from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard of it and the household of Pharaoh heard of it. And then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? Certainly could hear a pin drop. His brothers couldn't answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph comforts his brothers. He discloses to them in that moment, pastorally even, with love, God's plans. He says, look, there's five more years of this. They didn't know that at the time. And so perhaps they're hoping the best for the famine may have motivated them to just keep going in the first place. You know what? Winter rains are coming. Let's just get out of here. I'm never going back down there again. In fact, I'm going to learn how to fish. But he says, look, there's five more years of this. So he discloses God's plans, and then he discloses God's purposes as well. Look at verse 5 and 7 in particular. He says, now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me here. That's a perspective of someone who's hoping in God's promises. Before you, to, purpose statement, preserve life. And in the Hebrew text, to preserve life is right there at the beginning of the verse. That was, his per- that was God's purpose, and that was the first thing that is on Joseph's mind, God's purposes. That's the order in which you can have a ballast in your life to keep God's purposes front and center. And so that's what he does. He says, to preserve life, God has done this. And then verse 7, another purpose statement, God sent me before you. That is, it's not the back and forth that happened. God actually sent me, and then God actually sent you. Why? To preserve a remnant for the land and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. And this is just another testimony that that Joseph has God's promises in mind, the details in the text. Um, In my uh, NAS, it says to keep a remnant in the the earth. Uh, I believe this is a, a reference to the land of Canaan and the Abrahamic covenant to keep a remnant for the land. And then literally the wooden translation of the rest of this would be, and to keep alive a great number of survivors. Imagine that land and a great number of survivors. That's God's purposes in this. That's what he's doing right now. And so be settled that it's God at work here. For Joseph, God's promises were more formative than his circumstances. And when he communicates this to Pharaoh, my, my family has come down to me. Pharaoh's thrilled. Why is he thrilled? Because of Joseph's reputation. Joseph, you're telling me you have a dozen of you? <laughs> you have more brothers? So he's thrilled. Verses 16 through 20, this is what happens. Now, when the news was heard in Pharaoh's house that Joseph's brothers had come, it pleased Pharaoh and his servants. Then Joseph said to his I'm sorry, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, say to your brothers, do this, load your beast and go to the land of Canaan and take your father and your father's household and come to me. And I will give you the best of the land in Egypt and you will eat of the fat of the land. Now you are ordered, Joseph, do this. Take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives and bring your father down, bring your father and come. Do not concern yourselves with the goods or the best, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. All of Jacob's household comes down to Egypt as it's recorded in chapter 46, along with Joseph's plans to establish them in Goshen. When his brothers go back up to Canaan, this is what happens. Look at verse 25. When they came up from the land of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to to their father, they told him saying, Joseph is alive 
And indeed, he is the ruler over all the land of Egypt. But he was stunned. The text says that Jacob's heart stood still, for he did not believe them. When they told him all the words of Joseph that he had spoken to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry them, this would have been a royal caravan, the spirit of their father was revived. Then Israel said, it is enough. My son Joseph is alive. I will go see him before I die. So Israel set, sent out with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offer sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. And then it's at that time that God speaks to him once more and says, Jacob. Jacob says, here I am. He said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt for I will make you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt and I will also surely bring you up again. And Joseph will close your eyes. Wow. Joseph reunites with his father. And the entire household comes down, 66 in all, including Jacob's, Joseph's household. There's 70 of Joseph, Jacob's household there in Egypt. And they settled in Goshen and in the city of Avaris, which is later renamed Ramses after the great Pharaoh that would live centuries later. But when Jacob does arrive, Joseph brings him to Pharaoh. And I want you to see in chapter 47, beginning verse 7. Then Joseph brought his father to Jacob and presented him to Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, how many years have you lived? So Jacob said to Pharaoh, the years of my sojourning are 130. Few and unpleasant have been the years of my life. Nor have they attained to the years of my fathers that they lived during the days of their so sojourning. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. And that Pharaoh was blessed. This real blessing did occur and that Pharaoh was blessed. Sesostris III's reign lasted about 50 years. So another 40 years or so after this event occurred. And so with Joseph's influence on Pharaoh and Jacob's blessing that he gives to him, this Pharaoh um, accomplished more than any other Pharaoh before him. And the archaeological and epigraphical records tell us that during his reign, the political landscape changed completely. Up until this point, there was a system of nobles, right? You can think of uh, a president and governors, although it would be quite different because these were sovereigns. And so the noble system uh, was throughout the entire land of Egypt and Joseph and and. and Pharaoh was just sitting on top of that as the sovereign of the land. And, but in this time period, what, what conventional scholarship cannot explain is that the system of nobles completely vanished. And, and they, they would say in a very short period of time, we would say on an afternoon, because we have the biblical text. We actually know why that system of nobles vanished. Uh, the political landscape absolutely changed. And for 230 years, the only biographical information that we have and the only um, uh, epigraphical information, that is the hieroglyphics, uh, recounts stories of the sovereign pharaohs. The, the under rulership in Egypt was completely gone. And you can see why that is. Look at verses 20 through 21. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for every Egyptian sold his field because the famine was severe upon them. Thus the land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he removed them to the cities. That is, he redistributed all the people, all the nobles and all the, all the rich and all the poor got redistributed to city centers during this period from one uh, of the Egyptian border to the next. And then skip down to verse 23. Then Joseph said to the people, behold, I have today bought you and your land for Pharaoh. 
Now here is seed for you that you might sow the land. At the harvest instruction for Pharaoh's people, you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh and four fifths shall be your own for, for seed of the field and for your food and for those of your households and as food for your little ones. And you might this, think this is a grievous decision by the government and, and by Joseph. But look how his people respond. So they said, you have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord. That would be Joseph. And we will be Pharaoh's slaves. So it's true. Last week we reviewed where the, the dream that Pharaoh had had and what Joseph had interpreted uh, said that the, the abundance would be great years of abundance, but the famine would be so bad that the abundance would be totally forgotten. And so that, that is what happened. Joseph bought all of the land, all of the livestock, and all of the people, save the priests in the uh, cult worship system that they had, for Pharaoh's, as, as Pharaoh's personal assets. And so for 230 years, Historically, we don't even see any writing about these other people. It's Pharaoh and everybody else. It's quite fascinating. And so, uh, Jacob, when he blessed Pharaoh, he, he surely was a blessed king and, and reigned another four years, some years. But for Joseph, increasing Pharaoh's prosperity and his kingdom was no threat to God's purposes. And so he, he, didn't, he didn't have God's purposes in one hand, his promises, and then, and then tried to be the, the solver for God's promises. He was dependent on God's promises, looked forward to those promises, and knew that his job was today where God had him. And so he was faithful to what God had in front of him that day. And, and for Joseph, his job was to in, increase the reign of his master on the earth and and he knew that this would be no problem for God. In fact, he might have even recalled that God told Abraham, surely your people, your descendants will become slaves in a land not their own 400 years. I have no doubt in my mind that Joseph, as he got older, saw this is exactly what's going to happen. It's going to happen here in Egypt. And, and I played a role in that part. And, 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 and he wouldn't have said, I'm grieved over increasing Pharaoh's kingdom. <laughs> he would have said, God had me do a job and I did that job faithfully. I did it well here on the earth and no expectation this side of heaven is where my hope is. And so we can learn from that. And so in that way, Joseph and the prophet Daniel have some parallels, right? Both lived as high officials under a pagan king looking forward to future expectations, and yet for the moment that they lived in, they administrated government with exemplary leadership as a slave, submitting to their earthly authority with an unwavering faith. And so uh, I have one more photo for you just to demonstrate that this is perplexing to modern scholarship that sees tombs from this period that are unfinished. You can see here's one example uh, where a tomb was built during this period, and there's no plaster on the walls. What, when, if you went down into that tomb, you would normally take a left or a right, but the, the, the shafts just stop midstream. And along with that, all of the biographical material from this period just stops. And Joseph played a role in that because he bought all of the people for Pharaoh, and yet there was no conflict with the plans that God had had. And so jo Joseph did his job in his day, looking forward to God's future promises all the way to the end. Next week, we'll look at the end. There is a 17-year gap between what we've looked at today and chapters 48 and, I'm sorry, 49 and 50, where Jacob dies and then Joseph dies. We'll look at those in detail and see their faith strong all the way until the end. So be reading chapters uh, 48, 49, and 50, and then also look at Hebrews 11. Two occurrences that we're going to look at, the death of Jacob and the death of Joseph are both recorded in Hebrews chapter 11. So go ahead and look at that as well. 
we'll go ahead and finish there, and we will see you next week.